That is uh, certainly a, an appropriate song for where we're going to be today. And there's always, you know, things that, that go through the minds of a person that is, that is uh, having a hard time or suffering. You know, and, and what, what do you tell somebody whenever they're suffering? You know, what, what do you say to people who, uh, <clears throat> for whatever reason, have lost everything? You, you don't see it much around here, but um, there, are, there are other parts of this world where people lose everything on the, on the, uh, because of their faith. I, I think um, the statistics are um, basically ranging from over 100,000 uh, to somewhere over 350,000 people who are killed every year because they're Christians. And, and, and like I said, you don't see that much here that people lose everything or have to live under those circumstances because they are Christians. But even at that, though, we do have persecution here. And, and how do you counsel somebody that goes to work every day and they're, they're slandered and persecuted and and things because of Christ being in their life. What do, you, what do you do? How do you counsel somebody that comes home from work one day and walks into the kitchen and finds a note on the counter that says, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I just can't take it anymore. I'm out of here. How, what do you say to a person like that? What do you say to a person that is that is sick and on their deathbed? How do you how do you counsel somebody in those circumstances? Well, Jesus has something here that he's going to offer us. And remember these these were actual literal letters to seven churches that we're going through right now and this is Letter number two, it's to the church in Smyrna. Um, Jesus has some words for the church of Smyrna, even though this letter was written to the church of Smyrna. It is still relevant today because, you know, I would venture to say that, that everybody here has some kind, of, some kind of trial, some kind of tribulation, some kind of problem that you would say, is a significant problem. And that's something that kind of binds us together as a church. You know, it, 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 as we grow uh, in our faith and as we grow as a family, as a church family, um, we're going to find that there are similarities in our lives around the problems that we face. Right? There are two things that, before I get into the, the scripture text, which we'll get to here in just a minute. There are two things that I want you to remember. And these things have been proven true time and time and time and time and time and time again. The first one is this. Although there may be specific problems in your life, and I'm trying not to be such a downer today. I'm trying to keep us from going to, oh, my life is a mess. And, you know, I just don't, <laughs> whenever I go home this afternoon, I'm just going to put on my bed clothes and veg out. Well, you may do that, but at least watch some football I mean, or something. But one of the things that I want us to realize today is this. Regardless of what's going on in our life, God has blessed us all. Oh, God hadn't blessed me. Well, you're here. You got up this morning, and if you're like most households, you probably put on some coffee, you know, Said hello to all your pets. Got them, put some clothes on. You have a vehicle or some other form of transportation that you were able to get to church. God has blessed us. 
And the second thing is this, and we have to remember this. And this is for the church of Smyrna as well. God continues to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt, day in, day out, that he is sovereign over everything. You may think he's not because of something not going necessarily the way that you want it to go, but he is sovereign over everything, including your life. You know, the last couple of years have been really, really hard. They've been hard years of testing for everybody. And, um, you know, families have suffered and churches have suffered and communities have suffered. The tremendous thing about being um, a Bible-believing, expository church is that we find in God's Word all kinds of little gems that prepare us, help us to understand how to deal with these problems. And so that's where we're going today. Um, God said, uh, this is His Word, um, that he won't necessarily take care of our trials and tribulations. He, he won't necessarily pull us out of the fire. But he did give us this promise. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. What a promise. And we've got to remember that. We've got to, we've got to really latch on to that and apply it to our lives. All right, now let's see what the Word of God says for the church of Smyrna. This is Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Just four verses this morning. Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So just a little bit about the, the, uh, the city of Smyrna. Um, it was founded about 1000 B.C., but it was completely destroyed around 600 B.C., completely destroyed. And then one of uh, the generals of Alexander the Great um, came in and rebuilt the town and, and, and built it beautifully. It was, it was a marvel to go to Smyrna and see how beautiful it was. It was so beautiful that the people of Smyrna were very proud of their town. As a matter of fact, they were so proud of their city that they said, this city is the only one that died and has risen again. <gasps> Verse 8. Let's see, what was it? Jesus identified himself as the first and the last who died and came to life. Jesus said, you may think that you died and was risen again. I'm the only one that has done that. I am the first and the last. I died and came back to life. And that's why he addresses himself that way. To the church of Smyrna, because they, everybody that was at uh, part of that church would would know exactly what he was talking about. It was considered among the Greeks to be the the most beautiful city ever built, and uh, it was on 
a hill that would rise up. And it kind of looked like it was rising up out of, the, out of the sea. And as it would rise up, on top of this, this mountain was um, uh, where they built all of the temples for the pagan gods. Beautiful temples. I mean, it was a competition. You know, you got this God. Oh, let's build this really beautiful temple. And, oh, we got this God. Let's, be, let, let's build this really beautiful temple. And so you would look at Smyrna as you looked up toward the top of Mount Pegasus. Uh, it looked like a crown sitting on top of the city. That's how beautiful it was and how magnificent those temples were. Smyrna was also the, the center of Caesar worship. And it's where out of Smyrna came this, this um, love for Rome. Uh, it was a love for Rome that was so magnificent that um, they decided that they wanted to worship Rome. Out of Smyrna, also Smyrna, if I say it like that, Smyrna, Smyrna, its chief export was myrrh. It's from the base, it's from the base myrrh that they, they created Smyrna. You, you get what I'm saying, right? There were three times that Smyrna was used in the Bible. You've got the first one where they brought gold and frankincense and Smyrna. And the second one was, um, was uh, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, they brought him a mixture of wine and Smyrna. And the third one is, is uh, of course, Nicodemus in, in uh, placing Smyrna or myrrh in the 100-pound bag of aloes and other kinds of herbs uh, to shroud the body of Jesus for burial. Three times. So it was, it was a, very, uh, um, a very useful but, but a very pricey extract. So number one, Smyrna, the suffering church. Why, why was Smyrna the suffering church? We don't know a whole lot about the founding um, church in Smyrna. It was probably as a result of, of Paul's, one of Paul's missionary journeys. Maybe, you know, somebody that was a, a disciple from another church or a leader from another church came and built it. But I'm sure it was, it was uh, because of Paul's efforts that the church was built. We do know that they were a church that was under great persecution for the sake of Christ. Great persecution. Um, the letter to Smyrna is the shortest of the seven letters, and if you noticed as we read through there, there's nothing there that's negative about the church. It's all positive, and it's encouraging. And Jesus himself wanted to encourage the church because he knows what they're going through and what they're suffering from. Um, the, the Christians... In Smyrna, didn't meet in an uh, elaborate temple. Um, they met in uh, kind of obscure, quiet places like homes or uh, catacombs or outdoors or you know anywhere that they could meet, quiet place that they could come together without being disturbed. And so, for that, they were kind of, you know, ridiculed by uh, the people in the town. You, you know, you're really not worthy of being a citizen of Smyrna. Uh, those kinds of things, because they were, they were quite simple. However, remember I said that out of Smyrna came Caesar worship, emperor worship. Well, just like, just like we would not do, um, the Christians in Smyrna would not bow. And they would not give homage to the emperor. They have to understand that Romans back then, 
loved Rome. They loved Rome so much. It, 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 it was because of uh, Pax Romana, which is the, the peace of Rome. You know, the, the Roman government had provided uh, all of this might, uh, roads built, great cities and and all kinds of things and they they kept peace everywhere because of the military and all that kind of good stuff so people loved rome and they wanted to worship rome it's a little hard to worship an empire like rome and so what the citizens decided to do was to worship the emperor who represented rome now at first the emperors they weren't real crazy about it and then they kind of caved a little bit and, you know, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe that's okay. And then they started liking it, as most power-hungry people would. And then finally, they just decided to make themselves deities. And everybody then had to worship the emperor. But the Christians in Smyrna would not. And because of that, if the, the town folks found that you were a Christian, you lost your job, you lost all of your possessions, they would beat you, they would burn you, <laughs> tie you to the stake, um, they would boil you in oil, uh, or they may send you to Rome to be eaten by some ravenous animal in the Colosseum. It wasn't good to be a Christian in the town of Smyrna. So you see why they were suffering. They suffered because of the cause of Christ. In fact, John's banishment to Patmos was as a result of his unwillingness to worship the emperor Domitian. And Domitian, trying to get rid of John's influence, said, well, I'm just going to send you over to this little island where the prisoners are and put you to work. And so he sent him to Patmos. Um, they were considered to be, by the Romans, bad citizens. Just absolute bad citizens. And so um, Christ says to the church in Smyrna, he knows their works, he knows their tribulation, and he knows their poverty, and, and he knows the slander, which is you know, kind of like blasphemy. It's, it's, it's persecution of those who are, who, who are fake Jews, but they're actually a synagogue of Satan. And with that, then, we have to look at a couple of words to really understand um, the fullness of what God's Word says. So the second thing is this. It's, it's just a couple of words that I want to share with you that, that really describe how these people lived on a daily basis. The first word is um, philipsis. It's a word that means uh, tribulation, um, pressure. pressure. And, and I'll give you an example of the kind of pressure. If you can imagine being uh, tied to a table or being staked to the ground somewhere and over you is this big flat boulder and they have this mechanism a lever um, that they can very slowly lower this thing down and it comes to rest on your chest well at first you're going to be okay i mean you're still going to be able to breathe and and take in some air but then as that thing comes down a little bit more there's a little bit more pressure a little bit more pressure a little bit more pressure and eventually there's so much pressure your lungs can't expand and you suffocate that's the kind of unrelenting pressure that they went through every day it, 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 was, it was a slow, relenting, never-ending, day-after-day pressure that these Roman people, these, these Roman citizens, put on them and put them under because they wouldn't conform to their ways. The second word is this, poverty. Poverty. Um, there are two words 
Two Greek words in the New Testament that, that speak to poverty. One is penis, P-E-N-E-S, which means uh, poor to the point that you live day to day, you, you know, paycheck to paycheck, okay? The other word is tokia, and it actually starts with a P, uh, P-T-O-C-H-E-I-A, to, tokia, and that means you're absolutely destitute. There is no way that you have any resources to do anything. You're at the bottom of the barrel as far as poverty is concerned, and no way to get out. Well, that's the word that Jesus uses talking about the Christians in Smyrna. They were absolutely destitute. Destitute. Because of their lack of loyalty to the emperor. The third word is this, persecution. Persecution. Um, and this is oppressive treatment. It's... it's um, uh, in, inflicting all kinds of pain on a person through not necessarily physical pain, but, but it could be physical suffering and could be death. It could be just you know, the loss of, of civil rights, the loss of property, those kinds of things. Persecution. That's how these people lived. The word used in this section is uh, slander. Uh, some other translations use blasphemy. It, it, this, is, this is that group of, of uh, fake Jews, by and large. Uh, they, were, they were fake Jews in that they had um, converted to the traditions of Judaism but they were really interested in this grace thing that the Christians were talking about. And so they wanted to kind of be part of the Christian group. But they also wanted to bring in the priesthood. And that's kind of how you get the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. They have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But it's, you know, a lot of tradition, a lot of other kinds of things that go along with it. it, it in... In Ephesus, just 35 miles south of Smyrna, you remember last week, they had um, apostolic succession. Some people were, were trying to one-up each other because they would say, you know, yeah, John actually touched me, and so I'm an apostle as well. well no, no, you're not. And the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. Um, and then you have this group, this group of fake Jews who want to also bring in Judaism, traditions, and, and the priesthood into the Christian efforts. But Jesus says, you know, they're not really Jews. They're actually um, a synagogue of Satan. So don't mess with them. So number three, how would Jesus counsel the church? How would Jesus counsel the church? Well, let's look again at verses 9 and 10. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 10, Jesus actually gives them two commands. The first one is this, be fearless. And the second one is this, be faithful. Be fearless and be faithful. And that's not necessarily a, you know, just a trite kind of rubber stamp on solving their, their problems. Um, we kind of seem to throw those kinds of, of statements out pretty easily this, these days. Um, and they could, looking at that, you might think, well, how in the world are these people in Smyrna going to be fearless and faithful? What is that going to do for them? Fearless and faithful. How is that going to help them? If you're pressured, if you're poor, if you've 
are being persecuted, what, would it, what good would it do them to hear, be fearless and be faithful? Well, it's an excellent solution if you look at who said it. Who said it? Jesus said it. Be fearless. Jesus said, don't fear what you are about to suffer. Now, he's not saying don't be afraid of anything in general. He said on what you are about to suffer, the thing that you are facing. Fear not. Don't fear. It's like David. David wrote, um, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So the Christians in Smyrna were not to fear pressure and poverty and persecution that they were up against. And the second thing Jesus also said in verse 10 is this, Be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. So let me, let me ask you this. What do you do whenever you are facing pressure? Well, most of the time, I think, generally speaking, we complain about it, right? That's usually the first thing. You start complaining about it, and then you try to get out from under it as quickly as possible. And, and, and you know, do a lot on your own, and then you suddenly realize, I hadn't prayed about this. And so then you go down this path, you know, Oh, Lord, just deliver me from this daily pressure. Oh, I hate my job. I need a new job. Oh, my finances are horrible. I need to make some more money. Oh, gosh, I'm sick. I don't want to be sick. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to die. Oh, please heal me. I'm being persecuted every day. Please take away my enemies. Isn't that what we do? You know? And I would say to you, suck it up, buttercup. You know? I mean, do we pray for those things? Yeah, 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 yeah. You need to pray for those things. I, I, I mean, the, the, the example for us is Jesus. Jesus was facing the cross, and what did he do? He goes and he prays about it. And then we, as far as we know, three times, but I bet you he prayed a lot more about it than what we know. But what did he do? He said, not my will, but yours, O Lord. And he went to the cross. So he drank his cup. Now, if... Jesus told them to be fearless and faithful. He's telling us to be fearless and faithful. And, 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 and why should we be fearless and faithful? Well, first and foremost, if you're a Christian, then you should believe that God is sovereign. Well, what does that mean? As Pastor Cliff would say so eloquently, what? does it mean it means that God is in control God is in control and he can and does care for us and love us are you sure about that yes I am sure he is the person that loves you more than anybody else you will have ever met in your life that's how much he loves you and if you're really, 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 really a Christian, then you have given complete control over to God. And what does that mean? What does that look like? How do you do that? It means that you gave it to him and you, you don't need to try to take it back. Chances are there's not anything you can do with it anyway. But let him have it. Leave it with him. And whenever you find yourself in a season of trial and tribulation... Whatever the thing may be that you're facing, know this. He didn't put the fire out in Nebuchadnezzar's day. 
with the three Hebrew children. He let them go in the fire. And then he brought them out. Untouched. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. Now, if you, if you are in just a few feet of, of a car with somebody smoking in it with the windows down, and you leave and you come into the house, you're going to smell smoke. But these boys didn't. Why? Because Jesus was in there with them. So you give it to him, you leave it with him, and in the seasons of trials and tribulations, know that he will carry you through the fire. He will carry you through the fire. I promise you he will carry you through the fire. Number four, here's some, some quick reasons why we should remain fearless and faithful. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 again. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. So the first one, letter A, the first one would be the reputation of Christ was better than the reputation of Rome. The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. That means everything. The church at Smyrna needed to know that he transcends all time, all space, and he is more powerful than death itself. That's pretty significant. Christ is in the beginning and the end and, and all in the middle, on the top and the bottom and from north to south. I mean, he, he's just all in it. He's all in it. He's in the midst. Secondly, B, the recognition of Christ was better than the recognition of Rome. There's this tiny little Greek word, oida, O-I-D-A. And it simply means this. It's, it's a huge meaning, though. It means, I know. I know. So Christ was saying, I know. I know what you're going through. I know what you're experiencing. I know you're experiencing pressure. I know you're, you're experiencing poverty. I know that you're experiencing persecution. I know this. But it's, it, it, the word doesn't necessarily just mean an intellectual understanding. No, the, the word actually literally means a person knows it because they've experienced it. So Jesus is saying, I, I know. I know what you're experiencing. I know what you're going through. Number three, let us see. The riches of Christ were better than the riches of Rome. Although they were poverty stricken, destitute, they were rich at the same time, Jesus said. I know, I know that, that you are poor, but you're really rich. Why could Jesus say that? Why would, why would he be confusing like that? Why would he contradict himself like that? Because the economy in heaven is a completely different economy than here. It's a totally different system in heaven. And Jesus knows this family of believers in Smyrna, and he says, look, you know, you're, you're actually pretty rich. You're pretty rich. Don't look at what's going on here. Just know what's waiting for you in heaven. Letter D, or number four, the handling of time of Christ is much different than the handling of time by the Romans. Now, Jesus warns them that some of them are going to be thrown in prison for ten days. Now, uh, I've read a lot of commentaries on this. And it, it could mean that they were going to go through ten waves of persecution, which they did. It could mean that um, they were going to suffer ten years, uh, which they did under Domitian, Emperor Domitian. Um, the reality of it is, nobody really knows. Jesus just said, you're gonna, some of you are going to go to prison. Satan is going to be testing you um, in and, and, uh, 10 days. 
What did he mean by that? I don't know. Whenever I get to heaven, I'll ask him for you and let you know what he says when you get to heaven. I asked Jesus about those 10 days. And you know what he said? It, I meant 10 days. We don't know. But the significance of, the, uh, of time with Jesus is, 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 is kind of twofold. One is, Jesus is outside of the realm of time. So he looks at time completely differently than we do. Right? One day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. You know, it, 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 it may be um, that Jesus was saying, honestly, you're just going to suffer for a short period of time and then you're going to be in heaven. And that's forever. It, 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 it may be that he's looking at Time, as he always does, as a finished picture and trying to encourage them. All right, number five, letter E, the rewards of Christ are better than the rewards of Rome. Again, in, in verse 10, uh, Jesus says, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. Why? Because I'm in control of everything. I'm sovereign. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you a crown of eternal life. The crown of eternal life. That means that unless the rapture happens, we're all going to die at some point in time. Well, I, I don't like it when you talk about that. Well, it, Okay, you're going to die. At some point in time, if, if, if Christ doesn't come back, we all are. And, and I don't know if you've heard this little saying or not, and I'll share it with you. If you are a Christian, you're born once, you're born twice, but you only die once. If you're not a Christian... You're born once, you die once, you die twice. And that's, there's no riding the fence. That's just the way it goes. I hope, I hope that everybody here has been born twice. Because you'll only separate from this body once. You will never, never, ever be separated from grace and the love of God. You will never. But those who are not Christians will be separated from their bodies and then they'll be separated from the grace and love of God but not His wrath. They will suffer His wrath for all eternity. Ah, okay. What in the world... Would, what, what, oh goodness, oh, I'm trying not to use a bad word. What would make a person not choose Christ? I, 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 I don't get it. I don't understand. You know, some people have the attitude of, well, you know what? Uh, I know it's kind of rough right now, and there are Christians all over the world who are being killed and, and persecuted and all that kind of good stuff. But I just, you know, I, I think I'm just going to hang out and not be a Christian for a while. I'll, uh, if you guys get raptured, then I'll. I'll know it's real and I'll change my mind. No, you won't. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, God will give you not only a messed up mind, but a mind that will not change. He will put on you 
this grand delusion, the Bible says, such that you will believe the lie. What does that mean? That means that once the rapture happens, it's over. Game over, dude or dudette. No more changing your mind. Nobody else. It's the time of the Gentiles is gone. It will be the time of the Jews. That's what the seven years of tribulation is all about. We're going to get into that. What would make a person not do that? Not become a, a follower of Jesus Christ? In, in conclusion, let me tell you about this, this guy. This guy's name is Polycarp. P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P. Polycarp. And Polycarp, um, in AD 156, was... He, he was a disciple of John. Okay? And so he became a leader of the church. Very, very significant in the church. Polycarp was a magnificent leader. Emperor worship had become so hot that it was mandatory. Mandatory. And Polycarp says, I'm, I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to worship the emperor. I'm just not. And so they think, they being the Romans think, if we go get Polycarp, and kill him, it'd be like, you know, cutting the head off of, of a snake, that all of these Christians will, will come around. So Polycarp left Smyrna, went out of town a little bit, a little bit and, and held up in a farmhouse. The people of the town, the citizens of the town, the good Roman citizens of the town, found out that he was at the farmhouse. So they, they send the military out there to go get him. The soldiers show up, and Polycarp says, Look, uh, I'm going I'm to come out peacefully, but I'm going to pray a little bit first, and then I'll come out. Okay, sure. So he starts praying, but while he's praying, he sends food out to the soldiers. He's feeding the soldiers. These are the same people that are going to take him to town and kill him. He comes out. They carry him into town, and all the townspeople are, are now looking at how are they going to do away with Polycarp? What kind of entertainment are we going to have today? And it was, I mean, they were ruthless, cruel toward Polycarp. So they staked him in the ground, put him on a, on a stake, put wood all around him, lit it on fire, And this is what he says. Eighty-six years have I served him, and he never did me any harm. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? The, the pro-counsel there, the, the main guy that was doing all this said, Well, I'll, I'll have you just destroyed by fire. Unless you change your attitude. And Polycarp said, You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little bit is extinguished. But you are ignorant of the fires of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Bring on what you will. <laughs> and as he was in the middle of that fire, those flames just swirling around his body, he says, I thank you that you have graciously thought me worthy of this day and of this hour, and I may be a part of the number of martyrs to die for Christ. The only way that he would have known anything about that is because of the letter that was written to the church of Smyrna and because of his being Influenced so much by John. Isn't that amazing? Huh. Would we be the same? Would we stand and say, you know what? 
God has been so good to me. How could I blaspheme the God who has loved me so? I couldn't. I couldn't. Let's bow our heads and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll have a song of response. Father God, we just are so humbled as we go through your word and we realize all of the, all of the things that the churches uh, endured. But we're so encouraged because you always talk about those who are conquerors, overcomers. Father, I just pray that this, this little small church, this little small family would be a church that would please you, that would offer to you worship that is true and sincere. I pray, Father, that as we go through the book of Revelation, that you would um, allow us to understand it. To see, to see it, the, the, the message of the book of Revelation for what it really truly is and that you would, you would enable us to, to grasp it. Um, to plant it deeply within our hearts and our minds that, that we would be able to share the message with others. In the end, Father God, we want you to get glory and honor in all things. And so right now we just, um, we, we bless you and honor you and praise you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.